Hello, I'm Teresa Scorson. I'm here again with the question of the uh, of the church versus the state, or with the state, however you want to want to say it. Um, I'm here with with the guests that we had last time. Have joined us again. Um, I want to introduce Rita Dooley, and this is Herb Davis, Robin Hensel, you know, and I'm of course Teresa Scorson. So let's get on with the discussion of church and state, the local view. Now you started to say that you wanted to talk about the church's family. Well, the church is basically a large family and we all know that there are problems associated with the family. And I think it's the problems within that family that cause people to leave the church. Hurts, specifically, uh, that come from part of the family within the church uh, tends to repel people away. Uh, but I don't want to forget, you have something really interesting written down there. Did you read that at the beginning, this last meeting, or, or the, our last filming? Well, I think I was just reading now. No. Yeah. What you had written down were uh, that one of the presidents had spoken. Oh, yes, that was uh, Eisenhower. You read that already? Yeah, well, I okay. read some of it. During the whole show that when we were filming before? No, I didn't read it when we were filming. Yeah, would you? Because that's oh, sure. interesting. Okay. I'm not entirely sure what, how this falls in with the, with the issue, but I suppose it does. President Eisenhower in 1953, um, when he was trying to wind down the, the war in Korea, said, Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, from those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hope of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this. A modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete highway. We pay for a single fighter plane with half a million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with enough new homes to have housed more than 8,000 people. This, I repeat, is the best way of life to be found on the road the world has been taking. But this is not a way of life at all. In every true sense, under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Why do it, that's, I think that's very good. Yeah. I'd um, like to respond to something <coughs> yes. that uh, Robin said. Again, I think we should be more precise when we're talking about the church. Uh, to say that the church is like a family, I think we need to be more specific. What church? Are we talking all churches, or are we talking opinion? When I state that any origin of Christ's existence that exists, that can be proven and verified, came generations after the supposed existence of Christ, that's not an opinion, and I didn't say in my opinion. But to say the church is like a family seems to be something you should say. In my opinion, the church is like a family. So that we know that you're talking about the church that you believe in. Because I don't think you know that the churches are like a family. I think that's just a belief that you have. Well, in the sense that, and I mean any church of any denomination, even non-denominational organizations. Anytime you get a methodical gathering of people coming together to worship anything, and I'm even going to include government in this, when you get a body of people who are coming to represent under the guise of their leadership because they've been elected, that becomes like a family. Anytime you get a group of people coming together to talk about matters of the heart, matters of conscience, um, matters of spirituality, matters of government, I think that would, to some extent, be considered a family. Okay. Can I interrupt and just sure. say, 
I know you believe that. I absolutely think you are wrong and false in that belief. And so I would just respectfully request that you say, this is the way I see it, or I believe this, as opposed to the church is, or the government is. I don't it's think it's like a deep, family. Yeah, it's very deep, sort of multi-generational uh, point of view. And, you know, I might say, too, that you can tell by the the pathology of these organizations, how much like family they are. The very dysfunction almost proves the point um, that Robin is trying to make, that this Th has... There are similarities. Yeah, there are similarities. Well, the reason I bring up this family issue, uh, call it what you like, and I didn't mean to offend you or... No, it does not offend me at all. I, I believe that many have attended a service of a number of different, any, any ideology, and they have decided not to come back or to repel that idea at some point in their life because of a hurt that was experienced within that organized religion or family-like setting. I'll give an example. My mom and, and my heritage um, on the Dutch side. My grandmother was from Holland, my grandfather from Germany on my mom's side. Um, when my mom was eight years old, she attended a Dutch Christian Reformed Church as a guest to a Sunday school Christmas program. And since the time my mom attended that service, she has, I won't say the word hate, but questioned and expressed her hurt. The, after the service was over, they served candy to every child there, but not the guests. Only kids that were church members were served candy on Christmas Eve. And my mom, I think that's where she became an atheist, or started to believe that there couldn't be a God associated in a group that would treat her like that. Most of my relatives on my grandmother's side were Unitarian Universalists. And that's different from the Universal Life Church that I'm a licensed pastor of. Unitarian Universalists meet and they're an organized group, and, but they're, they're not Christian. And my grandma, I remember being influenced and torn between her relatives and go, making a decision to go on with being a member of the Methodist Church in the town she lived at. And she talked to me about that as I was growing up and why she believed what she believed. Um, I, I, before I forget, and I don't want to go into this a lot, but I read, read a book, one of the most profound books I ever read was called The Shroud. And the book was, um, I, don't, I think the writer was an atheist, and became a believer during the writing of this book or during his journey to find out about the Shroud. Um, what did he conclude? Well, there is some physical evidence that the image that's on the cloth that is the Shroud could not possibly be, have been recreated because the technology didn't exist, but the image of Christ is on that cloth. And it is there in a way, I, don't, I couldn't find the book, I dug for it yesterday, but it, uh, the image of Jesus is on that cloth. You can clearly see it, and the story of that cloth, where it was taken over a long journey, and, and it's, in the, it's in a vault, I don't know what they call it, something like that, in, I think, in Rome. Uh, anyway, that was a, it's a fascinating story. I've never written any, I've never read any uh, book quite like that. And if there is evidence, it's in that book. Um, um, and it, it involves not only the imagery that's on the cloth, but little spores from different weeds and wildflowers and things like that that were in, uh, along the way on this journey, wherever it was taken. And it was, 
it had gone through a fire at one point. And uh, I just would encourage, if, if you have an interest, uh, <coughs> to at least consider reading this. It's not a very long book. Are, are you referring to the Shroud of Turin? Yeah. Then it's in Turin. And mm -hmm. uh, no, no rational person believes that that has anything to do with the supposed Christ, you know, Jesus Christ of the Bible. But many people believe it just like many people believe in Joseph Smith's angel, Moroni, who gave him the gold tablets that they now have in Salt Lake City. How, how else do you explain all the wonders, all the artistry in the meticulous artwork that's in uh, a fly's wing or an insect's eyes? or the coloration that's on the back of a beetle, or how trees and... Excuse me, you're expanding the topic. If you want me to explain all the beautiful artistry in the fly's wings, you have to give me more time, <laughs> okay? You can't yeah. just keep expanding and talking Well, forever. all of those things that I would consider wondrous. Right. How do you explain that if not attributed to a god? I'm just curious. I, I go to a scientist uh, who studies that kind of thing, and I ask him, could you put this into a visual that I could comprehend within an hour or so? I personally could not do it. And I understand what you are saying, but I hope you understand what I'm saying too. That the marvels of nature, the cloud formations, fingerprints, the, the baby smell, None of those things are proof or existence for a angel or a god or a savior or a virgin birth or any of the other things that are believed by many believers. But, They're nice stories. No, I understand that, but you're saying you go to a scientist, but he can't prove anything either. Yes, and he can. He can tell you where those wings came from. Excuse me. We've got to start this, ses this session over. Why? The, uh, there's a problem. There was a problem with the first five minutes here, and I just checked it, and it, okay. it's not That's coming fine. through. Oh. That's fine. But I really <laughs> apologize for that. No, not a problem yeah. at all. Problem. We're going to be So let's restart this one.